And we're live. Go ahead, take it away, Timur. All right, so hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the monthly audio program of Virtual Meetup. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And I'm really delighted to be here. Um, it's the first edition of the new year, actually. Um, and um, yeah, it's January um, 2021, yay. So uh, we have a bit of a lighter and shorter edition of the meetup tonight. We thought that was a good thing to do because, you know, people might still be coming out of the whole Christmas, New Year's kind of holiday period and just like recovering from 2020. Uh, that being said, we do have some really cool stuff for you tonight. And we also do have some really awesome guests. Um, my name is Timo Dumner. I am your host tonight together with Josh Hodge, who is also here. Hello, Josh. How are you doing tonight? I'm great, and uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you to everybody who is joining us today. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. On. <laughs> and we do have two wonderful guests, uh, Gregory and Oliver. Hello, Greg and Ollie. How are you doing? Good, Good thanks. thanks. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, yeah, great to, great to have you here tonight with us. And yeah, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, Josh, do you have any uh, kind of announcements, news, stuff like that to share with us? Yeah, the main thing is, uh, once again, just thanking our sponsors for helping to make this meetup possible. So thank you to the people at Juice, uh, Sonix, and Focusrite for sponsoring the audio programmer meetup and for uh, allowing us to make this possible. And as always, uh, for people who want to continue the conversation and link up and learn new things about audio programming, be sure to join us on our Discord server. You can join on theaudioprogrammer.com forward slash community. And also we are looking for talks as always for all of our pro audio programming meetups. So uh, we have talks, talk slots available for people of all levels. You don't have to be a 15 or 20 year veteran in order to present. If you have an interesting idea or something that you'd like to talk about or some thoughts around audio programming, we would love to hear them. And you can submit your idea and submit your proposal on the audioprogrammer.com forward slash submit. All right. Thank you, Josh. I think we can go straight to uh, our first talk, right? Yep, absolutely. Awesome. So uh, for our first talk tonight, we have Gregory Travis, who is an independent software developer, musician, and composer living in New York City. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about, um, actually, I'm going to talk, I'm going to um, ask you, uh, Greg, how do I pronounce this? Is it Rhythmer or? Yeah. Rhythmer, which is an interactive system for uh, creating semi-automated audio loops implemented in Haskell. So I'm really curious about this. I've tried to learn Haskell at some point. Uh, you know, there was this book, Learn Your Haskell for Great Good, something like that, which I really enjoyed. But uh, halfway through the book, I kind of uh, gave up a little bit. And um, But it looked really cool. So um, I'm really, really um, curious to see, see it in action. And, um, you know, what you're going to talk to us about uh, tonight it sounds really cool. So I'm really eager to uh, learn more about it. To everyone who is watching us on the YouTube uh, stream, um, so you can ask questions to Greg on the YouTube chat. Um, and if you do so, please prefix your questions with the word question in capitals so that um, it's going to be easier for me and Josh to see the questions and ask them to Greg afterwards. So uh, yeah, take it away. Okay. Um, you're about to see it almost in action. I had some technical problems, so I sent some screencasts to Josh. He'll be playing those, but it's those were recorded yesterday. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Hi, I'm Greg Travis, and I'm going to demonstrate my semi-automated music ma mashup tool, Rhythmer. I created Rhythmer to help me combine samples easily. It lets you sort through a lot of raw materials and find good combinations. It will even generate a simple sequence out of them. The sequence is randomly generated, so it isn't really a song on its own, but it's a useful starting point. Uh, due to streaming issues, technical difficulties, I'll be using some hastily recorded screencasts. I apologize in advance for the sound quality. Um, Rhythmer is definitely in the prototype stage. It's entirely keyboard driven. It's also written in Haskell, which I'll say more about later. I start by segmenting audio. Oops, sorry. I start by segmenting audio from a couple of songs into individual measures. In this case, a mixture of Final Fantasy battle music and Maroon 5. The upper left contains a subset of the extracted measures from the songs. Rhythmer is going to present me with a series of combinations of loops, and each time I decide whether I like it or not. 
After I make a decision, I'll get a new set of loops. The new set can be completely random or it can overlap with the loops I've already liked. If I like a group of loops, they're displayed in a circle in the affinities area in the upper right. If two groups overlap, the circles are combined. After a while, all the groups have, loop, have loops in common, and we wind up with one big circle, which tells us that the loops fit together pretty well. Once I have enough material, I tell Rhythmer to generate a short sequence for my choices. Now at this point, it's going to construct the sequence and generate the audio, which will take a few seconds. So the way that sequence is generated is, is as follows. It picks one of the groups that I liked and follows it with a similar group, one that has some loops in common. It does this repeatedly, so I get a good combination of consistency and variation. The more choices you make, the more material Rhythmer has to work with, and so longer, the longer the sequence. If I don't like the sequence, I can generate another one by running the same algorithm, but add a different offset into the groups I've chosen. This generates a new sequence using the same groups as before, but combined in different ways. There are many possible permutations, and I can use this feature to generate countless new sequence variations. And this is only one of seven sequence algorithms. There are other ones that vary more quickly, and even ones that chop the loops up or add glitches. And I on top of that, I have a separate script I use to run text searches on YouTube to download material to use in Rhythmer. That's where the next demo comes from. These loops are taken from a one hour live recording of Dave Brubeck. So the loops are taken from different songs, all from one long recording. I'm free to make my choices any way I like. I can prefer harmony to dissonance or vice versa. When you combine random musical loops, they often don't work together harmonically, but rhythm, lo rhythm loops do often work well together. The ideal combination is a single musical loop combined with multiple percussion only loops. And the definition of percussion loop can be very loose. That first part was, um, you know, sort of the chaos of making the choices. Right now it's generating the sequence, which we'll play in a second.
So that sequence was generated using a slightly different algorithm. It doesn't just use the groups I chose directly, but also takes subsets of them and combines groups that are similar. Finally, just a few words about Haskell. I chose Haskell mainly because I just really like it. Haskell has a really strong type system. Once you get your code to compile, it often works on the first try, which I haven't found to be true about a lot of other languages. Haskell is a pure functional language, which forces you to deal very carefully with state. This made features like undo relatively easy to implement reliably. It also makes it easy to rewrite and refactor. So I was able to try out a lot of different ideas over the course of the project. This version of Rhythmer isn't available for download yet, but I'll be getting it out soon. And that's Rhythmer. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Greg, for that uh, for that presentation, and uh, thank you also to the people that are watching for the uh, for their patience with the technical difficulties. Uh, sometimes these things run a little bit rough, but uh, we know that you're with us, and we appreciate it. So uh, we have a question from Marek Bereza, who asks, "How do you decide the boundaries of the loop?" I um, that is not code I wrote myself. I found a really good. Um, measure segmenter that uh, I think it's used a sonic annotator. I can uh, I can provide a link to that. It's it's not uh, it's it's an open source plugin. I don't know if it's what license it uses, but it um it works really well unless you give it something that's very uh, arrhythmic. But with and I'm also not sure how it works on like type six digits like five four, but it with four four it works great. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so does it time stretch the loops as well, or? It does not time stretch the loops. The reason that the loops in the first example sounded good is because a friend of mine seems to have the ability to think of songs that are in the same key and the same tempo, or in the same key if they're stretched to the same tempo. So I'm using just straight up resampling and for that. But I would consider using that. OK. Uh, Marcus Fitner asks, what UI framework are you using? Um, this is a Haskell library called Gloss, which is why um, there are no buttons and no menus and stuff. Um, it's actually pretty hard to find to do that kind of stuff in Haskell, um, which is why I'm started working on uh, Haskell bindings for Juice. Okay. And Mark uh, Santa Lucito asks, how are the rules? How are the rules to combining loops work? Is there a constraint solver? No, I mean, it's a simple graph algorithm. It finds connected components. So like in a, in a graph, any connected component, well, actually, so it starts with um, the, the groups you've liked, and that forms a graph over the space of all possible subsets of the graph. And then it finds path, paths through that space, which means a sequence of groups where each group overlaps with the next one. And then it walks through that graph and finds the longest possible sequence of groups that have those overlaps, but it's it's you could barely call it a constraint solver. It's really just uh, graph stuff. Okay, and Geraint Luf asks, so you're doing some type of clustering in the second algorithm. Does that affect with what groups it presents as candidates? What proportion of the whole group space does it end up able to guess? So in in both cases, so there's there's two parts. There's the part where it chooses what to present you, and then there's what it does with those choices. When it chooses what to present you, you can there are there are several keys you can use. Um, you can tell it to pick a random set, and those are like unlikely to or less likely to sound good with what you already have. You can choose to have a combination of some of the loops you've chosen and some random ones. You can choose to change just one of the loops or just a couple of the loops. So you have some manual control over how much each group is similar to what you've already chosen. And then once you've made your choices, in the first example, it only plays combinations you chose. It'll never invent a group for you. In the second example, it does invent new groups, either by taking subsets of the groups, which usually sound fine, and sometimes combining them, which sometimes don't sound fine. That was my first algorithm, and it was doing a little too much thinking for me, which is why I made the the a new algorithm, which is what the first song used. Very nice. And George G, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the last name, uh, asks, how uh, have you experimented with the counterpoint rules for composition? Haskell seems to be fit for that purpose. Um, yeah, no, I agree. It would be. Um, I'm not even doing pitch analysis. So I'm 
pretending, I mean, I'm just treating this as blocks of audio. And in fact, I initially meant to do it with only with percussion because it's it works a lot better, but it's it's pretty hard to detect percussion only loops. So I wound up using, uh, you know, pitched loops with it as well. But um, so far I haven't done any note identification. That would be definitely be very interesting. Great, looks like that's all the questions that we have. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, for your, uh, for your presentation, very interesting. You're welcome.